something that I like about you as a teacher figure is that uh, that that sort of what I'll call guru worship um, kind of evaporates or dissipates when when the the guru quote unquote or the teacher is saying, "Well, it's just my opinion, man." <laughs> so I, I and I see that as helpful. How do you? I uh, I I see it as helpful also. Um, uh, for example, if, if uh, I talked, uh, I mentioned yesterday that I, I don't use the term Four Noble Truths that are attributed to Shakyamuni Buddha. I say Four Noble Opinions. Now, partly I do that as shock value, because I could say Four Noble Teachings. Because in my opinion, there is no truths, and if I take the, the basic teachings attributed to Shakyamuni, you couldn't have the word truth. He, he's, he's saying there's nothing that's constant, everything has changed, there's no absolute. But you could call them teachings. But if I said Four Noble Teachings, that's still... Uh, and if I talk about my things as teachings rather than opinions, people will still take those as somehow true or, or real. And I think that's a trap, a problem. So I use opinions, which has more of a shock value, but it's also how I feel, that everything that's going on is our, our opinions, and the problems become when we think our opinions are true, or we think somebody else's opinions are false. That can lead to fighting. That could lead to not just arguing, that can lead to killing and to wars. But if we could live in the world of opinions and discuss our opinions, uh, you, you, it seems to me uh, you, you can't fight over that. I mean, it's, it's just an opinion, man. <laughs> Once we step out of, think of, of it being my opinion, it's like we've got a fixed lens, which is now just looking at things through that perspective. Mm -hmm. But if it's just all opinions, it's such an open, broad, mm -hmm. I mean, and then light becomes so wonderful. It's both serious and humorous at the same time. Is it okay to be happy when there's so much suffering happening? I, I think it's re a required to be full of joy in the midst of suffering. Uh, there was a Zen teacher that said, Every day when you wake up, first thing you should do is look in the mirror and laugh. <laughs> and uh, of course, I carry a red nose with me. And if things get too serious, I put my nose on. So in the midst of seriousness, yeah, I want to deal with things in a serious way, but also in a humorous way. Uh, within the midst of humor, there's a seriousness. Within the midst of seriousness, for me, there should be humor. Uh, do, you feel, do you feel like humor helps to open one's heart in those serious sure. situations? Definitely. Definitely. Uh, and so in the, in the most... In the most unexpected places, if you could bring humor in, you change the whole scene. I have a friend who's at Wavy Gravy who uh, has done a lot of stuff in that, in that light, done a lot of all kinds of things, but huge social activists. Uh, he, he was a promoter of uh, the Grateful Dead and uh, uh, a clown. So I went to him and to help me learn the trade and one of the, as we were talking, one of the things he said that is that he had a manuscript of humor written by inmates in Auschwitz. Well, that's probably the last place you would expect to find humor. And uh, we do a retreat every year. This would be the 19th year at Auschwitz. And about uh, maybe 10 years ago, 
we actually, I, I started within the Zen Peacemaker Order something I call the Order of Disorder, and it's OD for short, so it's the Odd Peacemakers, and we founded that in Auschwitz. And uh, so I'm always trying to combine the two, and I always have my nose with me. And if the situation gets too serious, I pop the nose on, and it's hard for anybody to remain too serious. Uh, sure. <laughs> in my opinion, Buddhist practices have to be ways of helping us experience the interconnectedness of life, the oneness of life. If you experience the oneness of life, that's just being. Uh, uh, what else could it be? It, it's just uh, what is. And through the ages, there's been so many different techniques, I think, to help us experience that. And the trap becomes, in my opinion, when we start putting those techniques or pious methods on the altar and we start worshiping those instead of, or trying to, to perfect those and lose sight of the fact that it's about experiencing the interconnections of life. And, and these are things developed to help us do that. Now we forget that and, and just start concentrating on uh, meditation, more important than visualization is, is, is a Tibetan way better than, uh, it's all nonsense. It's just different ways that uh, we're all quite different, so, we all are attracted to different kinds of ways. But I, uh, as Martin Luther King said, uh, I think it's important to keep an eye on the prize, and the prize is the experience of the oneness of life. So would you say that that is our, our basic nature, our, our, our true nature, would be that of the, the oneness, and that perhaps the... Well, I, I, don't, I, I don't use the word true. So, uh, I think it's what is, yeah, uh, and our brain can help us separate from what is, because it can, and that separation comes about by the labeling, and, uh, which we think is handy, and it is handy, but we then forget its labels, just like we forget that these are techniques to help us experience the oneness of life. We forget that labels are just labels, and we start calling certain labels reality. Mm -hmm. Reality, to me, is, is a concept that I'm not familiar with, so, <laughs> so I don't go there. Uh, but what is is what is. Why do you think we hang on to our seriousness? Well, we're so conditioned, you know. I mean, and uh, I'll. And the big tool for our conditioning, I think, is fear. We, we all use that. I, the governments use it, of course, to uh, condition us in certain ways and as a control mechanism. Parents do that with their kids. They use fear to do that. And then as we get older, all the activists do that. Don't, don't you know that if you do that, you're going to just destroy the planet? I, I mean, the fear is such a huge tool to condition us to be, and we go, oh, yeah, I, I, I see, so I, I can't do these things I do. Uh, I, th I, th I think fear is the biggest tool to condition us, and we all use it. Uh, so that, that for me is another important thing. If we can, instead of using fear as the tool, say, oh, that's an interesting way of looking at it, or that's an interesting opinion. If we could break it down, get rid of that fear aspect, I think we start getting rid of our conditioning. Uh, yeah. Anything new that's up for you these days? Like in terms of your consciousness? You know, uh, one of my problems right now is my cigar has gone out.
I also I, I love the fact that um, you know I'm not that old, but I'm like seven, be seventy six soon. That I'm still getting these epiphanies, these insights. So I think it keeps it'll keep happening probably until I die, and for me that's very exciting. Um, that things can keep changing dramatically. That the stuff. Usually, stuff that happens to you then conditions you in that way, and you gotta have, loosen that. But uh, to realize, to have experience that I'm still getting these, for me, ma major insights is, is fantastic, you know? Mm -hmm. it never stops. So, I don't worry about what's gonna come next, mm -hmm. but I know things will come next. And I try to run my life based on our three tenets of not knowing, not planning, not and uh, bearing witness to things that come up and things always come up and see what arises. And it's uh, in a way exciting to see that new things arise. We have a koan in which uh, uh, Shakyamuni's walking with somebody and he says build me a temple and the guy he's walking with a monk takes a blade of grass and puts it in the ground so that's the synagogue that's the temple that's the mosque uh, yeah the institutions, the, the edifices that we build, they're not necessarily synagogues or temples or mosques. Or, they're places where we can hang out and where some people can be in charge. But <laughs> the, it's right here, the temples, the, the, the mosques, the synagogues.